Okay, let's let's get started. Um, as we saw, lots of people coming from different time zones and areas. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, from wherever you're tuning in from, we're just so grateful to have you here. And first off, congratulations on your acceptance into our program. Um, we're so grateful that you've joined us to learn about the University of Michigan Department of Biostatistics graduate programs and to see if this is the right fit for you. I'm Kelly Kidwell, I'm the admissions chair. Um, I'm also the associate chair for academic affairs and I'm an associate professor in the department. I'm joined by Nicole Fennick, who many of you have probably emailed with, chatted with um, in this process, who's our grad program coordinator. Um, and I, we also have our phenomenal chair, Bramar Mukherjee here, and you'll hear from her in just a bit. And then you'll hear from our faculty member, Phil Boonstra, about his exciting research um, that he and his students have been working on. And then I know you really came for the student panel. So at the, at the mid to end, we will get the students here to present about life in Ann Arbor and life in our department. And we'll have an open Q&A section. So um, please feel free at that point, you can submit questions in the chat, but at any, at any point, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will, we will um, certainly address it. Okay, so what are we here to do? Well, we're here to provide you with some more information about our program to help you make the best choice for you on where to go in the fall. Unfortunately, we can't all be in person in Ann Arbor like we used to do pre-pandemic, but the pandemic has actually really allowed us to be more inclusive with this event since it's virtual and you can join us from like we saw all over the country. So we're able to really get to more of you in this way and we really like that. So you can join in your PJs or you can you know, be have just woken up or ready for bed um, from wherever you are. And that's a really great thing to learn about our program um, and to, to connect with some of your potential future classmates. Whoops. Hopefully you had the choice, the chance to join us a few weeks ago in the last week of February, we held a virtual connection week. And that's where you could zoom with our faculty and current students to learn more about the department and ask more personal questions. Um, if you didn't have that chance, no worries. You can ask many questions today or you're always welcome to email us. I had really great conversations during that time. I really enjoyed it. And I'm so glad that so many of you did take advantage of that connection week. I'd also like to point you to our website, our Virtual Admitted Students Day website um, that will have this video when it's recorded. It also has many other videos on there. So you have a nice welcome from our Dean of the School of Public Health from our chair, who again, you'll hear from today. But there's also more from our students and our faculty about their research and about committees um, that we have that we just couldn't fit into this event today. So please take advantage of all that content on our webpage. It's some great more inside info to our department. A few ground rules that I'm sure you're more than well versed in two years, uh, after two years of, of this pandemic and Zooming. But please um, keep your sound muted so that there's not a lot of, of a background noise. But if you do have a question, you can unmute yourself and speak up. You're also more than welcome to put that in the chat. Um, we'll try to answer any questions as soon as we can in the chat or as, as we're speaking. Um, and if for whatever reason, if we don't get to your questions, please feel free to email us. I'll put up our contact information in just a few slides. Um, you can email any questions. We can connect you to students if you would like to have um, more conversation with the students. And we will just want to make sure that you get all the information that you're coming looking for. Now, we hope that this goes smoothly, um, but you just never know if the internet gods are smiling upon us today um, or if any of us old professors are going to be technically unsavvy at some point. So please just bear with us. Hopefully, we will go through without any technical glitches, but hang on, um, give us some grace, and, and hopefully, hopefully this will go on well. So as I said, you're going to hear from our great chair, Dr. Mukherjee, and then we'll have a research presentation. I'll come back and I'll describe the program in a bit more detail and some sort of logistic steps and, and what to do about um, what to do next if you're funded or you're unfunded, things to expect. 
Um, I'll also talk about careers that our graduates get um, so that you can have a really good idea of this program and what you can get out of it. And then we'll get to that really good stuff with our student panel. So with that, welcome, congratulations again. We're so excited that you're here and we hope that we can help convince you that University of Michigan is a place where you could, you could be. So I'm gonna hand it over to Bramar now for the chair's welcome, and then I'll be back to introduce Phil. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope wherever you are, you have a good cup of coffee or tea in front of you to keep you awake. It does not seem like anybody is at the middle of the day. Uh, it's either too early or too uh, late. So. Um, my name is Bramar Mukherjee and uh, I am, I have the pleasure of working with wonderful staff, students and faculty at Michigan Biostatistics and uh, I'm the chair of the department. This is my fourth year as chair. Uh, I just am so thrilled to welcome the next generation of Michigan Biostatistics students. So we are speaking from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I just want to also welcome you from on behalf of the city, because students are a big part of the life of the city, and the city is also a big part of the life of the students. So as you can see that we can see the it's always blue sky here and uh, the bell tower you can see and two wonderful old theaters. I have to say that last night I went to see Batman at State Theater. It is not age appropriate, as Kelly said, that we are old, but it was a lot of fun, a house full of young people rooting for Batman. And so uh, I, I, in general, Ann Arbor has a lot to offer. I know that you will be very busy doing your homework, but those of you who are interested in art and music and hiking and, um, you know, uh, just walking and the lovely parks that we have to offer, you should look up Ann Arbor. It's, it's, a, it's a really delightful, pleasant town. So I want to give you a structure of a school of public health, because I know that many of you are coming from a math and stat background or biology background. Public health may be new to you as a discipline. So the six departments, many times I ask students, what are the six departments that we have in the school? And they do not know that because they know only biostatistics. But I think for our education and for our offerings, it's extremely important to know what our school's mission is, that we are here to prevent uh, human, human diseases and also to really increase equity in human health worldwide. So with our mathematical training, there is always a purpose. It is unlike like a mathematics or statistics department where uh, there can be lots and lots of projects which is purely abstract and mathematical. Here we are really grounded with the mission of improving human health. And uh, you can see the six departments enlisted in this slide and all department chairs at this point are women, we call ourselves the rocking chairs. Uh, the school provides a unique and a very supportive environment for students in order to grow to their next level. Also interaction with the different departments is a big part of being in School of Public Health. Sometimes if you are interested in climate change, you might want to sit down and have a cup of coffee with a student in environmental health sciences. If you're worried about when the next uh, pandemic uh, surge is going to happen, modelers from the epidemiology department will be happy to have a little conversation with you. And I have to say, during this pandemic, all the departments have played key roles in advising policymaking at the state level. So the school plays a very strategic role uh, in determining and governing public health policies in the state of Michigan and also nationally and internationally. At the Department of Biostatistics, I have the pleasure of working with two wonderful uh, women leaders, Kelly Kidwell, whom you just met, and I hope you get to meet Professor Lu Wang, our Associate Chair for Research. Uh, we come from very different cultures and very different language and food, but we come together uh, to advance the department and we have a lot of fun together. Uh, this is all of us. We were one of the largest departments in um, probably in the world. We have uh, 41 primary faculty and then many other joint appointments. This is all of us. And if you were walking in the corridors of the fourth floor of the School of Public Health building, the chances are that you'll run into one of them. And that's not happening in Zoom. So I just wanted to give you a sense of 
uh, what it may look like. So we have lots and lots of students. We have lots and lots of students from all over the world. So if you have looked up the history of the department, I always like to talk a little bit about history. Uh, the department was founded in 1949, and it is one of the oldest uh, departments in biostatistics, but I always say it is one of the oldest, largest, finest, but one of the kindest departments of biostatistics as well. So we have 230 students coming from uh, all over the world. As you see on, your, on, on the Zoom call, there are people from different parts of the world and different parts of North America as well. And so together, we try to really advance biostatistics and train the next generation of scholars in biostatistics. And that has been a fundamental mission. Home of World Scholars has been a fundamental mission for this department. So what do we do? If you look at our mission statement, we definitely try to provide high quality training and education uh, to the next generation. That's our, our flagship graduate program is our pride. And we put in a lot of work to keep it updated and relevant and thriving with intellectual energy. Uh, we, a second part of our work is really to make sure that in campus, uh, reproducibility in research, rigor in scientific research, proper design and analysis are implemented in biomedical studies. That's really a collaborative portfolio, which is very unique to a biostatistics department. If you're thinking about uh, choosing between statistics and biostatistics, and I know many of you are, uh, this is the part, the collaboration with our campus partners, with an oncologist or a pediatrician or an environmental health scientist, head to head every day. That's what makes us very unique from other quantitative science disciplines. And so this really um, biostatistics department has very strong footprint. We have collaboration in almost all schools in the University of Michigan, and yes, even in School of Music. Uh, and uh, we try to really make sure that faculty and students and staff, this big enterprise of data analysis on campus gets done well with a focus on health. But then there is a part which is beyond academics, which is our life in the uh, in the department. So uh, over the last few years, there has been tremendous progress in emphasizing on diversity, equity, and inclusion in make and making the climate uh, welcoming to all. Because as many of you know, that data science and uh, in general science has always been criticized for being for a selective few. And so how can you open up and how can you make it more welcoming and equitable to all? And so in summary, we are trying to work on important problems. We are an intellectually vibrant and socially progressive community and committed to improve human health. So uh, some of our areas of strength, and you are going to hear from uh, some of our research presenter, including Phil today about some of these areas. Uh, we have traditional strengths in longitudinal data, survival analysis, missing data, uh, statistical computing, survey methodology. This has been our really strong areas of research since the, since the department was founded. But we have exceptional strength now in causal inference, in clinical trials, in electronic health records, in genetics and genomics, uh, in imaging analysis, uh, in high dimensional inference, some of the new areas of statistics, which is more a blend of statistics, computer science and mathematics uh, together. Uh, those have emerged and we have very strong uh, skill sets and strong uh, capabilities in those domains and expertise in those domains as well. And uh, some of the new types of data, for example, uh, integrating the data from your smartwatch into your health prediction model. These are some new emerging areas of research where faculty have taken an active role in campus and also in the national scene. So along with our core intellectual areas of strength, there are some philosophies and some goals. Sometimes I feel like these days in academia, when you are a student, you're so focused on GPAs or your number of papers or number of grants, you kind of forget the bigger mission that why are you here? Why do you want to pursue a master's degree? Or why do you want to pursue a PhD degree? It's for your ultimate learning. So we have some shared values uh, instead of goals. Um, and so these are uh, articulated here, we encourage our student to explore ideas boldly. We want them to follow purposeful inclusion. 
uh, we have a mission of achieving greater good. Um, instead of competition, we really want to introduce a collaborative spirit. I want, we want our students to be self-determined and focus on a holistic well-being, not just academic growth. So what does a chair do? A chair's job, um, a part of the chair's job is absolutely boring and really, really uh, painstaking. But then there are some parts which are very interesting. So the boring part is keep the trains running, make sure that all the classes are happening during COVID, uh, the transition in terms of policies of public health prevention, make sure that everybody gets the clear messages. But then a chair gets to do uh, something new. Uh, if you don't take leadership responsibility, you cannot really usher in the change that you want to see. So the chair also creates new directions and um, destination for the department. So when I became chair in 2018, in my first term as chair, that was uh, the first three years, I really wanted to follow these six principles. Anything I did, it had to fall into one of these buckets. I really felt that in improving the research computing infrastructure was very important for the departments who invested a lot of energy and resources in there. Here are some of the six buckets that I have listed, and some of it I'm going to share with you because that's directly relevant to the students. Uh, so we recently launched a health data science concentration, which is going to become a full-fledged master's in 2023. And this concentration has allowed our students uh, to be to have access to a whole uh, slate of courses uh, which are focused on machine learning, higher level programming, uh, computing, and uh, embedded case studies in big data. And so you can choose a, one module where you learn deep dive into, say, imaging data or EHR data or mobile health data. Uh, so these courses, this advanced sequence of computing courses, as well as machine learning courses, have really, even if you don't do the concentration, has really opened up a lot of new choices. I always say that in order to be a strong statistician, strong biostatistician, um, you need three Cs, computation, collaboration, and communication. And these courses have really allowed us to strengthen one pillar of our training as biostatistician, which is computation. Then, and this is not directly relevant to you, but the school is advancing and exploring a lot of online education space. So we have been able to launch, uh, and uh, Professor Kidwell and Boonstra, who are going to speak to you today, both teach online courses. This is a new modality of teaching with which faculty are, experience, uh, are experimenting. So now uh, we also have a thriving undergraduate summer program to which um, many, many students, more than 60% of students have been in graduate school. Uh, and so far we have uh, trained about 250 students. And this is also another pride of the department to train the next generation of undergraduates and expose them to the world of big data and human health. So as I mentioned that if you come to Michigan, you'll have very strong focus on computing and support for computing because you have to sort of uh, walk the talk. Uh, we have cluster computing support and advanced research computing support through wonderful Dan Barker. And um, my client Sasser works with our faculty and students to develop our packages. Because many times, you know, your R codes just remain in GitHub does not get translated into a usable package. And so the department provides support towards them. Uh, so if you, I strongly encourage you to go to the, uh, if you go to our website and if you go to computing resources and software, you can see that all the packages that faculty have developed are organized into different buckets, for example, genetics or sort of survival analysis or Bayesian statistics. And you'll see more than 120 packages there. As statisticians, we uh, what do we produce? What is our intellectual product? Of course, papers and grants and uh, teaching students, but also these packages which are used for analysis all across the world by millions of people. In particular, you know, we have done massive work in genetics and genomics that uh, it used to be that many of the world's genomes got imputed in the Michigan server because of our capability in terms of supporting these large scale computing needs. Uh, as I said, along with strengthening the academic and computing and the intellectual part, we also want to be mindful. And Andrea Hill is a departmental embedded inclusion 
and wellness advocate organizes various events and also talks to students in moments of stress and moments of anguish. So this has been also a wonderful addition and a strong message to the department because graduate school is hard. There are going to be moments when you are going to feel lonely, you are going to feel um, discouraged and those moments are natural and I want to make sure that the students get through those uh, moments and we have enough support within the department uh, to provide to them. So our goal is to really build happier and stronger graduates of tomorrow. Uh, and you can see that if you don't recognize me, I'm here. I taught 699, our capstone course that's that year. And these students are all either graduated, doing wonderful jobs, or about to graduate. So it's wonderful to see what they have accomplished in since their master's in the next three or four years, which Kelly is going to tell me more about. So our graduate student body is extremely active and they uh, host many uh, forums for students to come together and you're going to hear from them. Here I'm listing some of the activities that they have spearheaded themselves, including the graduate student seminar, the journal club, the brown bag, uh, the BSA or Biostatistics Student Association organizes several events. They're going to have a um, dance lesson uh, evening as a bingo night uh, next week. Uh, and then we have statistics for community, which you are going to hear about a nonprofit organization working with um, you know, state, uh, um, state entities, as well as public libraries and so on to provide statistical support for those who do not have strong funds to do so, do those analysis. And then we have a, a, a really a good ensemble of events on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, this is all part of like, you know, in the second term, my second term in, as chair, I really want to see a climate change that like, you know, how do we pe bring people together and the sea change initiative has become much, much harder due to the pandemic, because none of us, uh, we have forgotten how to interact with friends and be in large rooms and gatherings and so on. So it would be a gradual process, but we are really trying very hard to again, re-enter the social scene and bring people together. And M+, plus, which is enhanced mentoring, how can you have mentoring at every level to mentors are incredibly important to go to the next step of your life. And so at st for students, for faculty, for senior faculty even, how do, can we enhance mentoring? And then leadership. I'm very passionate about leadership. And I think that leadership can come in many different forms as individuals in your community. So how can we develop that skill set from very earlier onwards? So you'll see a lot of programming, a lot of events focusing on these three areas if you choose to come to Michigan Biostatistics. Here are, we are sort of like, we used to be a very party department, honestly, uh, before the pandemic. Uh, and it has been hard, but you can see some of the events that are going on this semester. Uh, actually, this March, we have, um, we have the, we, in February, we had the uh, dumpling making party to celebrate the lunar year, uh, lunar new year. And then we have every um, month, we have a birthday celebration. Uh, just last Friday, uh, we celebrated uh, each, each everybody's uh, origin and uh, identity by sharing about our hometowns. And, um, and on Thursday, I got to see, watch the imitation game. I and Kelly were there in the Michigan theater with all our students, and that was lovely. Um, so I, as I said that we are, we try to think of the department as a family. And as you are thinking about Michigan biostatistics, what makes us unique and different is this uh, departmental activity. So you here you can see some glimpses of our following where um, it was very hard to achieve this in outside, but we still tried. We also have a special series of lectures which are becoming popular in the profession called journey lectures. Uh, we basically talk about our childhood and here you can see uh, some of the famous professors in Michigan biostatistics sharing their childhood photos and the steps and the journey that took us to the, took them brought them to this uh, time point in their career. Uh, we are also very good at skits uh, and I'm, I'm not going to like here you can see that Professor Rod Little uh, Kelly and I are uh, acting in a skit and if you go to our YouTube channel. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel, thanks to Kerry Sprague. You can watch all of our skits there as well. So 
um, you know, we, 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 when the pandemic hit, just to give you a glimpse that how the department really is very agile and nimble with respect to research. Uh, so when COVID-19 happened, faculty quickly pivoted and tried to contribute in various different ways to the pandemic. So for example, in the early days of the pandemic, Peter Song and uh, his lab uh, developed a transmission model to forecast for forecasting uh, for the pandemic in for the it was at that point it was still an epidemic in China, uh, but then quickly we became like you know that very adept with transmission models and disease uh, forecasting, and uh, we borrowed that model to write a paper on forecasting the pandemic trajectory in India. We were also one of the first few groups who actually characterized that the stark contrast between COVID inequities, uh, that the deaths and uh, COVID severities are not equally in, uh, distributed across race ethnic subgroups. So, um, and then one of our students built a, a very useful calculator to show that delay in care, that people are not going for cancer screening, what is that contributing to their ultimate cancer specific mortality. So all of this work has really put us in the media and in the biostatistics is always, you know, we work behind the scene, but this was a time where faculty really rose to the challenge and was very prominent in the media. So I think I have given you a glimpse of the excitement of the energy and the vision and the mission of our biostatistic department in a nutshell. Uh, we also stand out because we have a beautiful uh, departmental anthem. So if you want uh, to hear Rod Little sing this anthem, then you can go to this uh, link that I can put in the chat. Please don't play it now. Uh, but I just want to welcome you to this morning, to this virtual room, and encourage you to ask all of your questions that may help you to make your decision. I also want to tell you that if you come to Michigan Biostatistics, wonderful. But even if you don't come to Michigan Biostatistics, thank you for choosing biostatistics as a vocation for the next period of your study. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Bramar. If you do go to that YouTube and watch this skit, please do not judge me by my acting abilities. Bramar and Rod are, are much better than mine. It's actually quite funny to watch. I have an empty coffee cup and constantly it's like, it's like this <laughs> as I'm chatting. Um, but yes, we have a very, very fun and communal department that we really love to, to show you all the events that we're doing to bring ourselves, to bring everyone together. And we're doing more and more of that now um, as, as the pandemic dies down. So um, next we will hear from Dr. Boonstra who not only is one of our faculty members, but actually is a graduate or alumni of our program as well. Uh, he came, he started uh, or got his PhD in 2012 and then became faculty in the department. He is one of the best teaching professors that we have in our department and is also doing some phenomenal research. So we have him here today to talk about that. Are you able to share your screen? I shall try, yes. Okay. Looks like you should be able to. Yes. Are you see my full screen now? Yep. yep. Okay. All right. So um, thanks, thanks for being here, everyone. Um, as you can tell from my title slide, I'm not going to be talking about electronic health records. Um, that was my bad for not getting an updated title uh, to the organizers. And I would only embarrass myself in front of uh, the expert here, namely Bramar, by trying to do so. So all good. Um, but Bramar also uh, still nonetheless set me up well, um, talking about some of the work that our department does um, in COVID-19 research. Um, and that's, I'm gonna be talking just very briefly about a project that I did. It's not too technical. Um, I, I felt like I probably, shouldn't try to inundate you with details because uh, we don't really have that much time. So uh, that said, I'll jump right in. Um, I'm gonna be talking about a form of, of life support called ECMO, which has, has been around for uh, in some form for 
at least 50 years, it's, um, it's been pioneered uh, in neonate pediatric kids. Uh, it was pioneered in the 70s. Uh, there was a famous trial design that used ECMO. Um, a lot of the experts in, in actually implementing ECMO are here at Michigan. And it's found a, a role in supporting patients with severe COVID-19. Uh, as, you, as you probably know, as I'm sure you know, uh, COVID-19, when it becomes really severe, affects your lungs. And ECMO is a way to help you um, help support your lungs and your heart. So uh, yeah, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So first, I want to talk a little bit about what is ECMO for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, it's, it's an acronym uh, for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So extracorporeal is a, is a fancy biomedical term for outside of your body is how I think of that. And membrane oxygenation uh, maybe makes you think about uh, lungs, the role of your lungs. And that's in fact exactly what ECMO does. So I've got a, a nice figure here. Um, ECMO is literally a circuit of machines that, that patients who are uh, extremely sick um, with a lung injury or a heart injury uh, are, are connected to. So this is an example of one form of ECMO. It's called venovenous which means that the, the means in which the, per, the person is connected to the circuit is through their veins. So that's, that's indicated by the blue, the blue vessels here. Uh, it, it, venous ECMO is for folks whose heart is more or less working. Um, it is working. Uh, the, the, the hemodynamics are stable. However, your lungs are not able to oxygenate your blood. And so they're connected in a series. So it basically just extends the path that your blood flows. It leaves your body. It travels through a mechanical lung known as an oxygenator. It travels through a pump to keep the, the movement and the flow of your blood. And then it's returned to your veins. And so even if your own lungs are not working, for example, because you have severe COVID-19, the, uh, the mechanical lung will oxygenate your blood. And so it does some, your most vital living actions. The ECMO circuit does your most vital living actions for you. And it gives you as the patient the chance to recover. Uh, in this case from COVID-19, uh, it's used if you um, have had a, or need a lung transplant. Um, it's used if you've had a severe injury to your lungs. And it's not, it's not a, a restorative device. It's a rescuing device for allowing your body to recover from whatever insult it had to it. Um, there's other forms of ECMO. Um, this is what's called VA or venoarterial ECMO. This is when both your heart and your lungs are not working. So not only do you need your blood oxygenated, but you, you need the blood fully pumped by this mechanical uh, pump that's also in the ECMO circuit. So instead of connecting in series, to your circulatory system like VV ECMO, what VA ECMO does is it connects in parallel. It completely bypasses your heart by entering back into the arteries. Um, so it, it's uh, just like electric, electrical circuit uh, in parallel. There are two circuits happening here and, and one of them, the internal circuit is just not working at all. So that's kind of a very brief background to ECMO. It's extremely complicated. Um, very invasive, invasive, as you might imagine. It's, 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 it's life-saving, but for folks who are, are truly um, very near death. So that's ECMO. I'm gonna talk a little bit about where my data come from. Uh, ELSO is a nonprofit organization. It's based in Ann Arbor here, um, but it, it's world, it has worldwide reach in that it maintains this very large registry of, of so-called runs of ECMO. So a run of ECMO is when a patient is defined as when a patient is connected to the circuit and then disconnected um, when they're recovered or if, if they still aren't able to recover. So that's considered a run of ECMO. Relatively speaking at a given hospital, it's pretty rare. Um, and so you imagine it, it's hard for any individual hospital to do ECMO research. Uh, but so that's why a place like ELSO, which has this worldwide registry of ECMO runs is so important. Just to give you some statistics, um, they've, their registry dates back 30 years. Um, 
And over the totality of those 30 years across, uh, across the world, they, their registry contains information on 172,000 ECMO runs. I took this from their, their live dashboard um, yesterday, actually. And that's, that's for different uses for different age groups, um, different support types. Okay, so that's a, very, that's a quick background. Um, so COVID-19 is, is kind of an ultimate insult to lungs if it gets that severe. And so you can imagine that ECMO has found a role in supportive therapies for patients who are, are um, really suffering from severe disease. And as a consequence, as this confluence of experts in ECMO at the University of Michigan, at Michigan Medicine, of the ELSO registry, um, the, the else there was, um, they were kind of primed to spearhead some research on how, how outcomes for patients with COVID-19 have, have been looking over time. So um, pretty quickly into the pandemic, folks started using ECMO to support patients with the most severe forms of COVID-19. And um, generally speaking, there was kind of conflicting evidence about whether ECMO was, was working. And that's a, that itself is a pretty difficult challenge, uh, challenging question to ask. Uh, but so what we did, um, and this, this work happened uh, in the summer of 2020, so kind of right after uh, a lot of countries were just past that first large spike, we, we looked into the ELSA registry. Um, we collected the patients in the registry who had confirmed uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So that's the virus that causes severe COVID-19. Uh, we looked at adults and we, we pre-specified a time period. And we said, um, so, hey, let's, let's look at the ELSA registry. Let's see uh, what are the outcomes for these patients? Um, how, 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 how are they actually faring on ECMO um, as, a, as a supportive therapy for patients with severe COVID-19? So our original cohort was just over a thousand patients. Um, this, these are taken from 213 hospitals uh, across the world, across 36 different countries. So you are all very smart people. You can tell that no, generally um, hospitals are contributing one, two, three, uh, ECMO runs to these data set. So this is something that no, that would be difficult to do at any individual hospital and it kind of highlights the, the utility of a registry like ELSO. Um, what our kind of top line finding was um, all relatively speaking, a, a pretty positive finding given how, so keeping in mind that these patients were, were truly um, very close to death. Um, and this is really like a last minute rescue therapy for them. So 37% of, of the patients uh, in, in this registry who went on ECMO for severe COVID-19, we estimated that 37% of them died within 90 days um, post start of ECMO. And the, the remainder were discharged with a full expectation of living or discharged to another facility for continued recovery. So this doesn't capture the complete picture, um, but what it did, did kind of advertise to the, to the ECMO community was that it was having a, a, a relatively positive impact, um, keeping in mind that probably 100% of these patients would have died in the absence of this kind of last resort supportive therapy. So that was, that was um, reassuring to folks. Um, but then there was kind of an interesting um, second chapter to this. Uh, also, obviously, it was continued to be interested in this um, outcome. And what they were noticing empirically and what multiple groups were noticing was that mortality on ECMO seemed to be worsening. Um, so, what we did then was we basically revisited this registry about a year later. So now this is the summer of, of 21, uh, early uh, spring, summer of 21. We, um, re we looked into this registry and then we did kind of like this, this cohort study. We, so we looked at our original cohort time and then we looked at kind of like, you know, the 
pandemic is still ongoing at this point. We called it late, late stage. Um, now, unfortunately and sadly, probably you would call this more closer to something middle stage. But we looked at the, the remainder of 2020. How are patient outcomes looking then? And we further, we further realized that there were qualitatively two groups of these later, later stage patients. There were, there were hospitals that had never done ECMO prior to May. So they were what we considered late adopting. So they, they didn't have that, that potential benefit of early experience on ECMO. They had potentially started ECMO as a consequence of this first publication, this first finding that we had done that, that outcomes are pretty good. And then, so that was, I, that was what we call group B. So those were the late adopting centers. There were also centers that had continued to do ECMO. They had started early on, they continued to do ECMO. And interesting that what we found, if we looked at these three different sets of runs, these, these early stage um, A1 groups, these, late, these er, um, late stage from those same hospitals, that's A2, and then these late adopting centers, we found that mortality kind of like increased substantively between those three groups. So not only did uh, we have 37% um, mortality like we found before in A1, but in those two later stage groups, mortality increased meaningfully to 52% in A, in A2 and 59% in B. So just in my last couple of minutes here, I just want to kind of unpack some reasons why or what, what we were able to find out about why that existed and, and what we weren't able to determine about why that existed. Um, so that, that's, this is kind of a, an absolute risk of mortality that we're giving here. Um, you, can, you, can, if you've, you can probably intuit how to interpret this curve, but if not, you, you look at the height of these three curves and that's our estimate of the patient's mortality at that time, uh, uh, um, at that time within each group. So, but it doesn't tell us what explains those differences. And so what we did was we fit a model. Um, this, is, this is a regression model. If you've got some statistics background already, uh, we're basically trying to uh, estimate the association between that, that time of death with some of these known pre-ECMO patient characteristics. And so I just want to kind of unpack a little bit what we found here. So first of all, uh, we, we adjusted for group membership. And the top line finding here was that even after we, we accounted for all of these other factors that are known to be risk factors for these pre-ECMO characteristics about the patient. So for example, their age, their BMI, um, any comorbidities they may have had, any, and you'll see some others. We still found that the, the rate of death amongst uh, comparing these late adopting, so group B, to the not late, to the early adopting centers at the same time period was higher. So this green is the same as this green here. Similarly, we found that the, the, um, in that early adopting centers, their early, early pandemic outcomes were less uh, than their late pandemic outcomes. So the patients who were treated with ECMO died at a, at a slower rate than the patients uh, at those same centers who are treated later on in the pandemic. So we were positing that perhaps these differences in groups would go away once we adjusted for these known pre-ECMO risk factors. And that was not the case here. Um, as I said, what we found is that the rate of death for these patients tended to increase the older the patient was. Um, similarly, we found that patients who also not only did they have COVID-19, um, but some of these patients had uh, a recent cardiac arrest in their, um, in, 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 just prior to going on ECMO. And that indeed caused a substantively greater risk of mortality early on in the ECMO stage. And if they lived past a certain period of time, then their risk, that kind of in, immediate risk of death decreased slightly, but still remained. Similarly, I talked a little bit about the modes of ECMOs. 
um, patients who went on ECMO for a VA mode had worse outcomes than patients who went on in, for VV mode. Uh, other, other characteristics that we expected shown through. And just stepping back as a statistician, um, I do, I fit a lot of these regressions working with my students. I fit a lot of regressions like this where adjusting for multiple things. Uh, I still, even now, I still find it somewhat magical that uh, this statistical theory that if all you see is a bunch of equations, and that's usually how um, non-statisticians think of us uh, as just doing lots of complicated equations that makes no sense. This is kind of why that's still important is that um, it allows us to, to find both things that are known. So we, we would have expected if we didn't see that, for example, cardiac arrest was an important risk factor, that would have been somewhat surprising. This was kind of a, a known finding. And it allows us to find things that like we're trying to, to find out and learn more about. For example, we still weren't able to adjust away and capture all of the differences in risk between these groups. So I just, it, I, I find that rather, um, yeah, like I said, kind of magical that all of these equations still come out to something that um, is meaningful and interpretable and, and useful for folks. So just to kind of wrap up, um, what we saw was this 15% this increase in in-hospital mortality if we compare early on in the pandemic to kind of a, a, a middle stage in the pandemic of late 2020. And this, similarly, we saw greater mortality at centers that, that didn't start using ECMO immediately. So there's late adopting centers relative to these, these centers that, that did start to use ECMO. Um, that could be like an, an experiential sort of difference. It, ECMO is very much a uh, dependent in, in some ways on the experience of the center, the protocols that they have for when to replace equipment, um, what sorts of um, hemodynamics to set in term for the equipment. And the more you do, the better you get at it. And so there very much could be that experiential component coming in to explain that. Um, as, I've, as I've already suggested, these differences persisted even after we tried to adjust for what we knew were pre-ECMO patient risk factors. Um, one thing that we didn't adjust for because uh, it wasn't really the purpose of our model was that these patients may have had a different disease course and different, different levels of refractory disease. So disease COVID that's difficult to treat. They also had different treatment regimens this was kind of an interesting finding from our paper that if you compare the, the group A1, remember these are early on in the pandemic versus groups A2 and B, which were later on, late 2020, you can see that the, the proportion of, of hydroxychloroquine use dropped precipitously uh, as, as it was kind of learned that it's not a very good treatment. Um, conversely, remdesivir or um, steroid use increased substantially early versus late. So these patients receive different treatment regimens. Um, there are a couple limitations. Um, I already mentioned the second that um, not so much limitation, but reasons, re potential reasons for this. Uh, there is this volume outcome relationship that's definitely pl possible here. Also, um, it's important that to, to note that we don't necessarily know the final disposition of all of these patients. It's a limitation of the registry. More, a greater proportion of our later stage of our late 2020 patients were discharged to a facility um, known as a long-term acute care facility. That's kind of this middling ground where there still very well may be a mortality outcome and the registry didn't capture that. So it is important to be aware that this isn't a definitive finding that patients were definitely worse off later than, than earlier on. So just to wrap up, um, Kelly, I've got three minutes left, right? Okay, just to wrap up, I thought it would be useful to kind of step out now of the, the, the scientific presentation and just um, pontificate a little, if you will, on, on why I think that the, the um, this is very much a biomedical paper. I didn't really present anything especially statistical or technical um, uh, in, in terms of, of like innovative statistical analysis here. But 
I, I had a lot of hats in this work. Um, there was a there was a lot of data wrangling here to do, um, combining of data sets, making sure uh, pulling from multiple sources, multiple um, elements needing to manipulate data, create new variables that um, so so a non trivial data wrangling step, not something that you can do in a spreadsheet program like Excel. Um, there was there was analysis planning and execution so. Um, it's interesting as you as you become a statistician and as you interact with different folks, you'll find that you know we have this unique role of kind of stepping in to different areas of work, and you learn that those 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 areas tend to have you know certain analytic approaches that they do. It's just kind of like it's the thing that we do, and it often leads to other blind spots of where they're not aware of other statistical areas because it's not the thing that that field does. And um, one of one of your jobs as a statistician is to kind of identify those blind spots in methodology and say, hey, actually, um, yes, I, I recognize that this is the way that's done in your field. And, and actually, you know, some, maybe the data has grown and the methods haven't grown correspondingly, but in fact, there's, there's other methodologies that apply to your, to your area. And, and that very much happened here um, in this analysis. Uh, is, is I was able to contribute some of my knowledge from other fields of statistics to bring to bear into this. Um, there, was, there was work in interpretation and writing this document, making sure that, uh, you know, simultaneously we weren't overselling our findings, that we are properly acknowledging the limitations of what we found, but at the same time, um, being clear what it is that we did find. And, and all of that kind of falls under this last bullet point here of there was an opportunity to teach. Um, so I guess the last thing I wanna say is that um, these five bullet points, like, I guess I would just encourage you to take seriously your future educational goals. Um, you can find online these days, a lot of, of, especially this first bullet, data wrangling self, like being a self-taught data wrangler. It's very, it's very possible. Uh, I would encourage you to take seriously though the, the totality of your formal statistical education, hopefully at Michigan, um, but the, the things that you're gonna learn are not just gonna be a toolbox of techniques to do. They're gonna be a way of thinking and a, approaching a scientific problem, um, recognizing fallacies that, that manifest in new ways, but are still the same old fallacies um, understanding important study design elements. It's, it's a lot of these things are things that are gonna be very difficult or impossible for you to self, self teach. So just an encouragement to take that seriously. Um, and with that, I'll stop. Thanks a lot for listening. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully there was something that you found interesting and happy to talk more either, either now or um, if you wanna shoot me an email with more questions. So thanks. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for, for Dr. Boonstra before he leaves or turns his video off? <laughs> Anyone wanna ask any questions in the chat or speak up? All right, well, you're more than welcome to, to put any questions in the chat box. Also, maybe Dr. Boonstra can put his email in the chat as well in case you wanna email him directly. Um, that was just a really great talk and application of, of biostatistics and really you can see how what we do um, can, can make an impact. So that was phenomenal. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go back to sharing. So um, now we've been doing really great on time here and I'm likely to blab too much. So hopefully we can keep this going so that you can get to the students and get enough time there. Um, but I wanna review our department just a little bit more and give you more specifics about the master's and PhD programs, um, career placement and the next steps for you all to take. So as, uh, Dr. Mukherjee has said, we are a relatively large but very welcoming and familial department. 
we have 230 students, 133 or just over the majority are master's students. And then um, 97 of them are uh, getting their PhD. We have 40 spectacular faculty across a wide variety of research areas who obtain millions of dollars worth of annual research funds that support our students and all the valuable research going on in our department. Um, if you come and graduate from the University of Michigan Department of Biostatistics, you'll join the over 2000 alumni, which is just an excellent connected network, which can help find, you know, help you find a career and succeed. We had an amazing record-breaking year in admissions this year. This was my first as, an, as admissions chair, and it was really just amazing to see the number of applications that we had and to read all of the phenomenal applications. They're just so impressive. Everyone was so impressive. Um, and so we had 735 total applications. About two thirds were to our master's programs and about one third to our PhD programs. To date, we've admitted 363 master's students and 39 PhD students for whom we're still waiting to hear the offer. So this is not the number that will be in your class. This is the number that uh, could possibly be, but you know, we'll, we'll hear as, as the deadline comes closer. Um, all of our PhD students are offered full funding, which means that they're offered tuition benefits and a monthly stipend. And I'll talk more about how that funding works um, in a few slides, but um, only a very few of our master's students are offered, offered funding. <clears throat> We're prioritizing the funding for our PhD students, but we do have um, a number of partial tuition scholarships for which we're prioritizing for our master's level students. And there are quite a few of those who we, we have offered. You might be curious about the background of everyone here or who's applied. And um, so if we look at our master's class from the last year, about half of the students came from a math statistics or biostatistics background. Um, but you know, even though that's about half, there's still about half that didn't come from that background. So if you're from a different background, you're not alone. Um, about a quarter came from a biology or a chemistry background with a smaller percentage from a public health or engineering, um, business or economics or computer science background. So while most have math or statistics, as a background, we really only require those few classes, the calculus three linear algebra and an intro stat class. Um, and so that we still have a very heterogeneous group of students here from which we can learn from each other. Um, and it really just helps broaden the perspectives both in and outside the classroom. And we really like that in our um, cohort makeup. Our PhD cohort makeup is a bit more focused. Um, and so here you can see that primarily our students do have a biostatistics master's or background in our PhD cohort, um, but some do come from math, statistics, computer science, or just general data science backgrounds. You've already seen a number of these listed on Bramar slides, but I just wanna repeat again that we have so many amazing research areas in our department. Um, we have faculty who are experts across this wide range of research areas. This is one of the unique and outstanding points of our departments that I really like to focus on, point out to you, you know, make a star on your notes when you're thinking about University of Michigan, that you really don't need to know what you want to study when you come here. It's great if you have an area of focus you already are aware of already, but if you don't, that's okay. You come, you start taking classes, you meet with the students and the faculty, and then by the time you figure out what it is that you wanna do, um, I am more than certain that we have a faculty member who is pursuing that area of research. And it's not only in that area of research, but is likely one of the top experts in that area. And so it's really quite amazing the breadth of the research areas that we have both statistically and collaboratively that you can um, really gain experience from in your time at the University of Michigan. I won't spend too much time because you've heard from both Dr. Mukherjee and Dr. Boonstra about the fun, fantastic COVID-19 research that's come out of our department. You know, now we're hitting the two year mark of, of COVID and we're trying to find our new normal. It's been, it's really quite amazing to reflect on how many faculty were able to pivot 
and have added COVID-19 to their research, their research areas. I listened to a webinar the other day from Dr. Mukherjee and another faculty member, Dr. Banerjee, and it was just really inspiring to hear not only how they were able to, um, to take time to, to figure out how to shift their statistical methodology, methodology research to thinking about COVID in India, but also how they um, were really able to just engage in these humanitarian efforts in that way as well. And so again, just really striking about not only the statistical experts that we have, but also the kindness and, and wonderful people that we have in our department. Again, I wanna import, I wanna focus on the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our department. I wanna just bring special attention to this. There's really a big attention of DEI at the University of Michigan in general, but even within our department, um, we strive to uphold DEI in all that we do. We have both faculty and student committees who help us uphold these values and apply them in as many ways as we can. We have a very blended department, right? We have domestic students, we have international students from all over, and we try to bring everyone together with these uh, multicultural, intercultural events. And as Bramarin mentioned, the dumpling making event, this was such a huge success around the Lunar New Year. It was so popular that we ran out of dumplings. I promise we've learned from our mistakes. So if you come next year, I think we'll definitely do this again and we'll make sure to have enough dumplings. So don't worry, um, we'll, we'll figure out how to get everyone the dumplings that they wanted. Um, we've, we've had just really inform, you know, so we've had fun events, but then we've had these really informative and thought provoking DEI seminars and journal club meetings. The, the university and SPH put these on, but then we also have these committees within our department that really take a lot of time to think about, you know, how can we really relate to DEI within our own department, you know, even thinking about it statistically. And it's just, it's, it's very accessible and very comforting to be around your own colleagues and students. And so I really just, you know, I, I wanna make sure that we know that this is definitely a core value of our department and we have really great events and um, learning coming out of this. We truly feel that our department will really benefit from a more diverse faculty, student and staff um, makeup to help broaden our perspectives and that will eventually lead to better science. Okay, so we have all these really great initiatives and events outside the classroom, but now let me focus on inside the classroom because that is where a lot, you will spend a lot of your time, although I do hope that you take advantage of all of the great things to balance out um, outside of the classroom. I wanna first talk about our master's degrees and then I'll move on to our PhD degrees. So we have two different master's degrees. We have both an MS, a master's in science, and an MPH or a master's in public health. Um, these are very, very similar. So they are both 48 credit hours. They're generally what we think of as a two-year program or a four-semester program. Um, most of the credits are in biostatistics courses, but you can take courses across the university. And we encourage you to find elective courses that are really going to enhance your training. Um, you are required to take a three hour epidemiology course and there's also an online public health course that you're required to take for your degree. The MPH degree also requires an internship. So that's what sets it apart. It's gonna focus on that professional practice. Um, of course, masters or M the MS students are also um, certainly allowed to and encouraged to get internships in the, in the summer between their first and second years. Um, but if you're in the MPH program, it's going to be uh, a part of the degree, whereas in the MS program, that's going to be a bit more self-directed and something that you're doing for your own benefit. Um, the MS and MPH degrees are both going to provide a very strong statistical foundation for you to be an excellent team member. You know, really thinking about collaborative science, collaborative team, um, and you focusing on the biostatistics. I'll touch on the amazing careers in a few slides that you can get with a master's degree. Um, and really just our master's students have done amazing things with their career. A little bit more about the coursework. So part of this uh, require the, the biostatistics credits 
They include course, core courses in probability theory and statistical inference. There's also this applied series of courses which focus on regression and data analysis. Um, as you go through the program, you'll select biostatistics course electives, something maybe like survival analysis or computing with big data, Bayesian inference, um, et cetera. But then you also have a chance to take non-biostat electives. And so those can come from the other public health departments, uh, or they can come from math or statistics or computer science or engineering departments. Like I said, you're welcome to take any course at the University of Michigan. Um, and then in your last semester, all of your knowledge comes together in what we call our capstone course, Biostat 699, which likely will be one of the most challenging courses that you take in our program, but also the most rewarding and most useful class that will really help prepare you for your next step. Ramar also um, talked about our health data science concentration. So right now, this is in the master's specifically for the MS students. This is what we call a sub plan, this concentration. Um, you can decide to pursue this concentration once you're here. I think after your first year or after your first semester, you can decide if you're interested in this concentration. Um, it mainly defines your electives within the MS program. Um, and so those electives are gonna focus on data management, computing, modeling, analysis, and interpretation. You don't have to be in this sub plan or concentration in order to take any of those courses. So you're still more than welcome to um, take these big data machine learning courses, even if you're not going to have that concentration. It is a really great plan for those of you who are interested in working, going out into the professional world and really showing that you have this focus on big data. Um, and that you specialize in it and, and you want to pursue that professionally afterwards. So the health data science concentration has much of the same core course overlap as our MS, right? It's primarily the same that statistical um, probability and inference series as well as the uh, re regression or applied series. And then it's going to define your biostatistics electives um, that focus on the computing and are really going to strengthen your um, computing machine learning and big data uh, skills. You still get a little bit, you know, you still have some room to choose your electives. So it's not going to completely define them, but it is going to help you um, figure out which courses that you're taking. All right, and please remember that you're welcome to post any questions in the chat as I go. Um, if you are accepted into our PhD program, um, then this program typically takes about three to four years after you re you've received your master's or five to six years if you're coming directly from an undergrad degree. We do require the MS uh, coursework plus about another year of courses in the PhD program. Um, we have a lot of those extra courses are going to be like a real analysis class an advanced inference series, stochastic processes, and then some advanced elective courses. At the end of either your first or your second year, depending upon how you entered, if you entered with an MS or not, um, then you'll take a qualifying exam, which really helps solidify your knowledge. And it's, it's just a really great, excellent exercise in proving to yourself how much you've learned and how it all comes together. So it is a little stressful, but it's also just really rewarding to see how everything fits together. It's like the pieces to a puzzle and how you can apply them. Um, you'll, you'll, of course, work together with an advisor on a dissertation in an area that you choose to develop statistical methods. Um, so when you come to Ann Arbor, if you come here, if you come to the Department of Biostatistics, like I said, you don't automatically need to know who you want to work with. We'll help figure that out. And then um, you can approach any faculty member and ask them to help advise you on your dissertation um, and study the area that you're most, most interested in. All right, it looks like we have some questions, but Nicole is doing a great job of fielding them. So I'll let, I'll let Nicole keep fielding them and then I'll, we can take some at the end as well. Okay, so a little bit about funding, as I know um, many of you are very interested in what the funding sources it, what the funding sources are and if there's funding available, et cetera. So the majority, um, again, funding includes tuition, 
Um, it includes benefits like health insurance and then a monthly stipend for living expenses. And this is made possible primarily through graduate student research assistantships. Um, these GSRAs are what we call them. They essentially pay you to work as an apprentice with a faculty member on research projects and you work for less than, for around 20 hours or less a week, right? Your primary focus is your coursework, um, but then additionally, you're working with a faculty member for this funding. Um, we also have around 20 graduate student instructor positions. You might also know these as teaching assistantships or TA positions. Um, we don't have an undergraduate program in biostatistics, so there's not that many graduate student instructor positions. However, we do use these for the core biostat courses for other public health um, majors. And, and so we do have several of them. Um, these positions help faculty run their courses. Um, often the students are helping with running or teaching the lab sections. They're also helping with the grading and answering questions for students, so running some office hours. In addition, we have two training grants in our department which provide fellowships. Um, we have the genome science training program and also the cancer biostatistics training program. And then we have a few other fellowships which are supported by the um, university at large. As I've said, we've prioritized our funding for our PhD students, um, but we do have partial tuition scholarships for which we're able to award some of our master's students to help ease the burden of the cost of graduate school. I want to note here a little bit about summer funding, um, because I think a lot of times when people think about funding, they're thinking about just the academic, you know, maybe September through the end of April year. Um, but for those of you who have been promised funding with a GSRA or a GSI or a fellowship, um, or a GSRA or fellowship specifically, your position most often continues through the summer. So the advisor that you're working with generally um, imagines that you're going to continue working with them through the summer and, and working more on that research. If we've promised you funding and you have a GSI position, um, then also we generally try to find you funding during um, the summer as well. So um, if you're promised funding, that funding is for the full year. It's not just for the school year. Unfunded students might wanna search for internships for the summer experience, um, but outside the MPH degree, the internships are not required. They're completely up to you. Uh, if, you're, if you're funded and you do wanna pursue an internship as well, that's something you need to talk to your advisor with because again, your advisor is gonna expect that you're working for them. Um, so if you want an internship and you're funded, you need to talk to your advisor. Otherwise, internships are just something that you can decide to do, but they're in no way required for, for the degree unless you're getting the MPH. Let me just check out the questions. Are these numbers of students who accepted funding or offers? Oh, good question. So these numbers are actually, I think, for the current um, MS and PhD cohort from this past year. These are the numbers of positions that we have. We have 100 GSRAs out of our 230 uh, 30 graduate students. We have 21 GSIs, 14 fellows, and 18 partial tuition scholarships. These do not reflect the numbers for the incoming cohort or those that we have um, we have, we have uh, adopt, a given. So as you can see, right, we, oops, I'm going the wrong way. We have accepted 39 PhD students. All of those are fully funded. We have offered several um, master's tuition scholarships and some master's full funding. Um, but we also have all those students who aren't graduating that we're continuing to fund as well through these, met, through these um, different sources. Let's see, there's also 100 GSRA positions are for all students, not just the MS students. In fact, they're mostly our PhD students. Um, as I said, primarily funding is prioritized for our PhD students. What about the career outcome after the health data science? So let me tell you generally about career, um, career placement, which includes our health data science individuals. Um, I don't have it broken down by whether they were in the concentration or not, but you can get an idea of, of where our students are going. So that's coming up in just a few slides. But I do want to, again, um, talk about STATCOM. Bramar mentioned, Dr. Mukherjee mentioned it very quickly. I think the students might mention it as well. Um, but I just want to, again, put the spotlight on STATCOM, which is it really 
a, an, again, a unique thing to Michigan, make a star in your notes here, um, that this is a, gra this is a, a program that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that is student run and has had just amazing success. It's a community outreach program where students are leading projects for nonprofits and governmental and community organizations. And it's a really excellent way to get research experience if you do not have a GSRA um, or GSI position. And so this is a nice way that particularly for our master's students who are unfunded, um, if you're looking for research experience, you can join this group and get some uh, experience, also get to know your fellow classmates um, and apply your knowledge. So I really just can't say enough good things about this group. And I think the students may touch on it again later. Okay, so here's the good stuff about what you can do with your degree. So clearly <clears throat> we have awesome faculty and we have great, great classes and we have this unique opportunity in StatCom, which is convincing in and of itself to come to Michigan. Um, but really I'm sure you're interested in, well, what, what can Michigan do for your future? Where can it get you? Um, and can it get you to where you wanna be? So I just wanna make you know, and make sure that you know that um, if you graduate from our program, you can end up in these incredibly successful and lucrative positions across the globe, either from your, you know, if you get your master's from us or your PhD. Our departmental reputation is one of the best biostatistics programs in the world. And we have this strong alumni network, those 2000 alumni that we have from our program that can help our graduates get these positions. Our department often sends notices of open job um, positions of available positions. The School of Public Health also has this excellent career services department that really help build our students' resumes, help ready them for interviews, um, and then can also connect them with opportunities. So where do our graduates work? All over. Our graduates end up in academia. I'll show you a breakdown uh, more specifically about the percentage of students that go into, into these different career sectors. But I want to show you some of the specific names of the places that our graduates are going. So they're going to top universities um, in, the, in the US, but also around the world. They're going to tech and pharmaceutical companies, right? Anywhere from um, Amgen to Ford Motor Company to Google to Facebook. Um, and then also a number of our students are going into government, working for places like the FDA, the CDC, the NIH, or the Census Bureau. There are so many opportunities for biostatisticians. So to be more specific, um, again, I didn't break this down by our um, by whether they're in the, the HDS concentration or not, but for our master's students, about a third of our master's students go into industry, so like pharma and tech companies. A bit over 40% move on to a PhD, either at Michigan or elsewhere. And then 27% go into a research um, position either at a university or a hospital, and 4% often go into um, government or nonprofit positions. I would like to note that you see in blue this large percentage of students from our master's program who then go into our PhD program at the University of Michigan. Um, as our master's cohorts are increasing, this percentage likely will go down. So we want to really emphasize the excellent education that you can get in our master's program that's really setting you up for a professional career. Our PhD students, a little over half of our PhD students go into industry, almost 30% go into academia, while 10% go on to government or nonprofit careers. So there's really just a vast set of opportunities at your fingertips if you're a graduate of University of Michigan's bio, University of Michigan Biostatistics. Okay, so next steps. What happens now, right? You've gotten admitted. You're, you're coming to this program, and then what? Well, if you've been offered full funding, um, your decision actually, I think, regardless of what you've been offered, you, you make a decision by April 15th. Of course, if you know before that that you wanna come or that you're going somewhere else, um, please let us know as soon as you know. So that helps us um, figure out our numbers and the potential to offer other students position. So by April 15th, you'll have your decision. Um, 
For those who are funded right after that, we send you a questionnaire that asks about your funding preferences. You know, are you interested in being a GSI, a GSRA? Which professors are you most interested in working with or which research areas are you most interested in? And then we do our best to match your preferences with uh, the faculty needs and who has funding and, and what they need students for. And so we do the best to, to make that match. You'll hear from us in the late spring, likely the summer, um, in terms of what your position would be and who you'd be working with. At the very end, last week of August, um, you'll come to campus for our new student orientation. We have lots of great programming for our department and also uh, the School of Public Health has some as well. And then classes will start on August 29th. Um, if for most of our master's students here, um, we have not offered full funding. Um, so you are considered for funding for departmental um, funding when opportunities arise. You know, we there's the possibility that there could be additional GSI or GSRA positions that open up either within or outside of our department. Those will be few and far between. Um, more likely is that faculty will hire students for hourly positions. Um, there are many, many opportunities for these where you can work hourly with a faculty member on their research. Um, so you do get a nice hourly wage. It's the same as a GSRA or GSI is making. However, this doesn't include tuition. So if you do join our master's program without funding, you should be prepared to pay for um, all four semesters. We know that it can be quite expensive, um, but we do hope that this is a, a, we do think that this is a really great investment in your future that will come back tenfold, a hundredfold, thousandfold for you. So um, in terms of what's happening with, with uh, school and especially as, COVID-19 is you know, going to be our new normal. Um, we have this past year been in person. We are optimistic that we will be continuing in person, perhaps even um, without masks at some point. And so this is a residential program. You are required to come to Ann Arbor in the fall. This is not something that will be online. Um, but you know, we really wanna take advantage of those around us, learning around us and starting to form those um, excellent connections again. So, you know, as we've seen, public health is now more important than ever, and you really can make a difference, and Michigan Biostatistics can help you prepare for that. Again, I want to just go over briefly our shared public health values. Both Dr. Mukherjee shared some values, and these also come from our Dean, Du Bois Bowman. Really awesome that in our school of public health, our Dean is also a biostatistician. So we believe in compassion, we believe in innovation, we believe in inclusion, and we pursue impact. Just a really strong and wonderful set of values to always be thinking about in our, our time at Michigan and, and what we're pursuing and going forward for. So if you have other questions, um, please feel free throughout this time, students are gonna come on and present and answer questions. But if you think of anything after, this, this time um, you wanna ask a question or you wanna get in touch with a student, um, you need to know how, you know, what the deadline is or how things work, please feel free to email Nicole or Fatma. Um, you can also email me as the admissions chair. Um, all of our contact info is down here. Um, so please feel free to email us at any point um, or of course, check out our website. We have a great facts section, a frequently asked questions section which likely has answers to some of the questions that you have. Um, and with that, I think it's time for the students to take over, but again, congratulations, welcome. And we're just really excited about the potential of, of you deciding that Michigan is the right place for you. So students, I think Shumik and Ben, are you all presenting? Okay, great. And then I will help moderate the questions um, for you all when we get to that point. Okay, um, so should I share my screen and start presenting? Yes, please. All right, great. That means I think I need um, access to share okay. my screen. Okay, you should be able to now. Yeah, I think so. 
All right. Um, is my screen visible? Yep. And you see a photo of SPH, right? Yes. All right. Great. Um, okay. Um, I'll start. Um, just hope, making sure I have everything right here. Yeah. All right. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shomek. I'm a third year PhD student in the department. I've been in Ann Arbor since 2019. Um, and I've had a really nice time here so far. And I think that pretty much everyone who's part of the student community here will in some form or, or another share my experience in terms of the department and the university at large being a really supportive place for students when in both from perspective of academic development as well as personal growth. And um, hopefully my friends and I, we can talk to you about the kind of resources that we have access to and how they help us um, grow both as students and as human beings. Um, with that, welcome to Michigan Biostatistics. Um, so this is primarily going to be um, a talk about our shared experience as students in the department. Um, and hopefully we can answer some of the questions that you have for us. All right, um, so here's our panel of graduate students who have volunteered to share their experiences and hopefully answer your questions today. Um, so let's just, um, so I'll start by, so I, I was hoping we could all introduce ourselves. Um, ben, do you want to start? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, congratulations on getting admitted. That's awesome. Good for you all. Uh, I'm Ben. Uh, and that's a, a photo of my dog, my bark. This, so sorry. Um, I am a second year PhD student in the department. I finished my master's here in 2020 and I've been here since 2017. So I've been here for quite a while and you know, happy to answer questions on any, any part of this process for you all. Um, are we going alphabetically? <laughs> okay. Um, hi, um, my name is Devraj. Um, I'm a third year PhD student in the department. Um, congratulations on your acceptances. Um, hope to see a lot of you here next year. Hi, everyone. I'm Elise. I'm so glad that you're all considering joining Michigan. I'm a second year master's student in the department and looking forward to answering some of your questions. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to see you all on this call. Uh, my name is Emily, and it's my last year in the PhD program, so it's my sixth year in the department, and happy to answer any questions. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah. I'm also excited to see you all here. Um, I'm a first-year master's student, um, so I'm, I freshly made this decision, and I'm help, happy to help with any kinds of things that might come your way. Hello, everyone. My name is Lin Xuan, and I'm a second-year master's student here, and I will uh, be uh, PhD student this autumn, and we are coming to Michigan. All right, um, so yeah, that's it from us. Um, those are introductions, and we get on with the presentation for now. Um, so here's how um, I've structured this presentation for today. Um, so when you, if you do agree to come to Michigan, um, and we do hope you do, um, you're not just going to be a graduate student in the Department of Biostatistics. Um, you're also going to be a part of a vibrant School of Public Health, which the last time I checked is around 400 graduate students strong. Um, not only that, we're also one of the best public universities in the country. Ann Arbor has consistently been rated as one of the best places to live in in the United States. Um, the, commun the academic community and the, com and the people who stay in Ann Arbor, these communities often overlap and intersect. And hopefully they will play a strong role uh, in shaping your time in graduate school. Um, personally, I really like it here. Um, the purpose of the slide is to give you an overview of this presentation. So first we'll be talking about um, the departmental student experience followed by some information which is applicable to any student um, at the School of Public Health, um, the university at large. And finally, um, if you're staying in Ann Arbor, there's some stuff you, you're going to want to know about. And hopefully we'll be able to talk a little about those things. So um, this is sort of an overview of the departmental resources that we have access to and enjoy. Um, as of 2020, we had a student to faculty ratio of about six, um, which is better than the SPH wide ratio or the university wide ratio. So SPH has a student faculty ratio of nine and the university wide ratio is approximately 14. Um, we have a very supportive administrative staff as well. Um, the advantages of being part of 
the biostat community is that um, because it's so big is that there's always support if you need it. And that's really been, help, been helpful to me for the past three years that I've been here. Um, these are primarily, the things that you see on your screen are primarily the major areas which influence our lives in the department. Um, I don't want to claim that this is an exhaustive list, but this should have a good coverage in terms of your de departmental experience. Um, so as is the case with grad school, um, the program is both exciting and challenging for all of us. Um, so one of the primary things that we all rely on is academic support um, in the form of study groups or tutoring, for example. Um, for example, for me, most of my learning experience, which happened outside classrooms, was happening when I was discussing stuff with my peers. Um, and then after my first year here, I had to take the qualifying exams. Um, and for that process, we formed study groups, which were really informative and helpful. Um, if you're working on research problems and you're having a problem with, let's say, literature review, um, we have support from library staff to help with research. Um, the department is really supportive in terms of providing um, sources of support for well-being. Um, we're fortunate to have Andrea, who helps with career as well as personal guidance. In addition, both the School of Public Health and the university at large have embedded well-being resources as well as uh, more specific crisis support. Um, the department is really big on computing, and we have amazing computing resources. Um, one, if you are here, you'll meet Dan Barker and Mike Kleinsasser. They've helped save countless of my projects because um, I, I could do better with coding. Um, the department has its own high-performance computing cluster, which is really cool. Not a lot of departments have that, and they really let you play around in that cluster which is also pretty interesting. You can really learn about cluster computing because as a student of Michigan Biostatistics, you have access to the bio dedicated biostatistics high-performance computer uh, cl cluster of computing. Um, we also have pretty regular workshops for students to brush up on their programming skills. Um, a lot of the work that we do here is focused on developing analytic packages in R or Python, and there's support for that as well. Um, I think Dr. Kidwell mentioned StatCom before, and I'll be touching on that again. Um, students try their best to engage with the community, both within the department, as well as Ann Arbor. StatCom is a really nice example of that. It's a community outreach program, as we've spoken about before. It offers the expertise of graduate students free of charge to primarily nonprofit, governmental, and community organizations whenever they need some sort of assistance analyzing data. Um, ben, Hannah, and I, are affiliated with them, I think. Um, apologies if I'm missing anyone. And we'd be happy to answer any questions if you, if you might have about StatCom. Uh, we also have the Biostatistics Student Association, which organizes social events. If I'm not wrong, we have a bingo night um, in a couple of days from now. And then about three weeks from now, we have a salsa dancing class. Um, so it's, it's really good fun. Um, the Biostat Student Association does organize these events where you get to meet people in the department, but not in a classroom setting. And well, you, you get to learn more about people that way. Um, we have brown bag seminars as well, where we have invited speakers, where they talk about topics, which might include stuff like, what are specific computing resources that you can access in the department? Um, what about looking for jobs or internships um, and so on and so forth? But all of this is done in a really casual lunch environment. We have this new series called the Alumni of the Month series, which is another way for us to learn about career paths that we can take after graduation. It's really cool. Um, you can see pretty accomplished individuals doing meaningful work and think to yourself, that could be me one day. And having that sort of guideline or having um, these sort of models to look up to and build your career accordingly, I think that's really informative. Um, and finally, we have a lot of representation almost all the communities within the department have student members. Student feedback is solicited whenever possible. We have pretty regular check-ins from the department in terms of well-being and stuff. And the department's really invested in trying to understand how they can support us better. The peer mentoring committee in particular provides support and resources to students by connecting mentors with mentees. And that process really helps um, people transition smoothly to graduate school. Um, it helped me because when I moved here from a different educational system in a different country, having someone to help bridge the gap of what was expected of me as a student and as a researcher, that was really helpful. Um, and finally, we have a really active calendar as far as seminars and workshops are concerned. We have weekly seminars on Thursdays and occasional graduate student seminars where graduate students discuss their work. 
Um, it can be daunting to talk about your work in front of teachers. Um, a lot of us might suffer from imposter syndrome as well, but I think the graduate student working group is really good for graduate students because it's just your peers. And I think it's a more relaxed environment where you can share your work and get feedback from your peers. Um, these are primarily my favorites and that's an overview of the student life in the department. Um, but of course, um, all of these come with some advantages. Um, the things that are coded in red in your screen here are good sources of free food as well. Um, next, we'll take a look at um, School of Public Health Resources. There are many research initiatives which span across multiple departments and disciplines. It's a really good way to participate in collaborative research, um, which is a really integral part of the Michigan Biostatistics experience. Um, there's a host of student organizations. Um, I can think of the Public Health Student Assembly being one important forum for graduate, graduate students within the School of Public Health. Um, so right now, I'll just focus on two examples. Um, the School of Public Health Writing Lab and Career Center, because I think those are the ones people are most likely to follow up on as examples. The Writing Lab is one of my personal favorites. Um, it's been instrumental in helping me improve my scientific writing and scientific communication skills. And it's not just me, because if you're a part of the master's program, you're going to have to take the Capstone 699 course. And pretty much everyone who takes 699 has some sort of exposure to the Writing Lab. and Everyone I've spoken to shares my shares the same experience in terms of it being really helpful in improving our writing and communication skills. Um, the other really helpful career resource is the Public Health Careers Office, um, and that focuses on bridging the gap between our training in school and our professional aspirations. Um, they provide information on job postings, internship hunting, fellowships, and also organize workshops. And the most important part is that they are also willing to offer one-on-one -on -one appointments for career topics like writing cover letters, searching for jobs, negotiating a salary, and all of these new daunting things which we might have to deal with once we're in grad school. Um, and then we'll talk a little about the university. Um, as we mentioned before, it's one of the best public schools in the country. It's going to take a really long time to list all of the resources U of M has to offer. But um, again, I want to touch upon the important ones where um, we have a student university-wide student wellness program called CAPS. And there's a labor union for graduate students and a separate one from lecturers and a free legal clinic um, if you need it. Pretty much every year um, we listen to some story or another where a landlord or a leasing company or some insurance company or some airline company is being mean to a student. And all you have to do is just send an email to the legal clinic. And if your case is worth, if, if your case has merit, they'll help you out and it's completely free of cost. Um, if you're into sports, the university is a really good place for you to be at. There's pretty much every sport you want to play. Um, and I think I've mentioned this before, the University of Michigan has a competitive Quidditch team, which is really interesting to me. Um, if you're into Harry Potter, hopefully um, we can meet and talk about playing Quidditch here at Michigan. Um, and finally, there's Ann Arbor. Um, it's an exceptionally pretty town um, across all four seasons. It's a really pretty town. Um, it's consistently been rated as a great place to live in. Um, the public school and the library systems are really great. In fact, um, Ann Arbor probably has one of the best public library systems in um, Michigan and maybe even the Midwest. Um, nightlife is also pretty vibrant. We have some nice movie theaters. Um, if you, um, we actually had a departmental screening of the imitation game at um, one of the theaters here in Ann Arbor. And that was a really nice evening that we enjoyed. Um, the, we have multiple good auditoriums. In fact, I was at a concert last evening at Hill Auditorium where the acoustics is amazing. The art and culture scene is also pretty nice. The summer months are particularly good. There's food festivals, there's art festivals, and the entire town is really colorful. Um, if volunteering is meaningful to you, there's plenty of volunteering opportunities. If you'd like the ability to be give back, to, if you'd like to have the ability to give back to your community. Um, however, um, Ann Arbor weather can be um, something that's strange at times. And I think we'd all be doing your disservice if we didn't include a caveat. The weather really could be better. It's not predictable. So um, our training in biostatistics isn't going to be useful there. Um, bring your coats and bring your swimsuits. Bring everything that you have um, in terms of being able to cope with the weather. Um, that brings us to an end in terms of the kind of stuff that I wanted to talk about. Um, but I wanted to really mention, reinforce the point that what makes this department unique is the people. Um, I've been here for two years now, and I think within a couple of months, it became clear to me that I had made the right decision. And I think that that's the biggest sense of satisfaction that I get from this department, that 
I don't I have the luxury of looking back and saying I did the right thing by coming to Michigan and I hope you can say the same for yourself. Um, I understand that it's not the easiest thing to leave an environment that's that's comfortable for you and that works for you and move to a town which might be new and maybe a little daunting at times. But like I said at the beginning, Ann Arbor is it, it grows on you and pretty quick you think about calling it your second home. Um, so yeah, that's it from me in terms of presenting. I'll stop sharing my screen now and maybe we can talk about questions if you have them. I'm gonna bring all of the students on spotlight here. And then um, students ask away, feel free to put your question in the chat box or um, speak up. And if you don't, then I'll ask some questions, but I'll give a moment to see if, if there are any. We had some questions about StatCom that we answered in the chat. A um, lot of interest in that. I think I was, uh, maybe, maybe you all can say, um, does StatCom give a presentation at orientation or how do students really get to know about StatCom to be able to join it? Yeah, so we every year give a presentation at orientation. There's usually at the very beginning of the year, a, a general body meeting, um, emails go out throughout the course of the year about current projects. We get projects on an ongoing basis, try to recruit teams for those projects on an ongoing basis. Um, so if you do come and you are interested in joining StackCom, like that information will be given to you immediately upon arrival. And then when we get projects going, obviously we recruit students onto those projects. And so, but basically anybody who wants to participate in StackCom can and will participate in StackCom in, in some uh, way, shape, or form conditional on us having projects, but we usually do have projects. So yeah, it's a cool organization. Thanks for having interest in it. Okay, there's a question. What do you do for fun in Ann Arbor? Who wants to go first? I can go. Um, depends on the season, totally. I mean, like it's not, I, I'm from New Mexico. So it was like, that's a very even answer. You know, like you can do things outside for quite a bit of the year. Um, but it really depends. I mean, during the summer, there's like a really, a lot of really cool stuff to do. I like to go running. I play in like the summer soccer league. Um, visiting the rest of Michigan. If you do have a car or know somebody who has a car, you know, you can go see the Great Lakes. You can drive up uh, to the Upper Peninsula, a lot of really cool things. Uh, during the winter, uh, a lot of thinking about what I'm gonna do over the summer. Um, I, I go rock climbing, there's a rock climbing gym indoors. Uh, like Shemar was saying, there's a lot of really good intramural sports, gyms, things like that to go do that are free of charge to students. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I would add, um, if you like playing sports, there's a lot of intramural sports. If you like watching sports, there's also great sports within the University of Michigan. Um, a, couple, a group of us from the Biostat Department are going to the women's gymnastics meet tonight, so we like to get together and do that type of stuff. Um, I also really like exploring coffee and food scene within Ann Arbor. I'm realizing even though you know, I'm done my program in a couple of months. There's so many places that I haven't tried. So um, there is a lot to do within the town as well if you're a foodie, especially. Yeah, to add on to that, one thing that I really like about Ann Arbor is the restaurant week that just happened a couple of weeks ago, where a lot of the restaurants will put out new menus with different prices, which are much more accessible to students. So it's a great way to also try some of those restaurants that are a little out of your price range unless your parents are visiting. <laughs> so that's also a fun way to explore the city as well. Um, there's also a really fun, Bill's Beer Garden is a, a popular place in the fall and in the summer. I'm excited about a kickball league this next summer. A bunch of my friends are coming together to do that. That's in the community. So it'll be with like local families and things like that. So lots of fun things to do. That's great. So there's a question about the requirements for master's students to apply for the UMish PhD. I'm actually going to take this one quickly uh, as the admissions chair. 
Um, there are no specific cut points of, GS, of GPA or anything like that. We're looking for well-rounded, smart students. Um, but as I said, as our master's cohorts get larger, um, you will be considered among the pool of all of our applicants for our PhD program. Are there healthcare resources available on campus? Can any students speak to those? Yeah, I will. Um, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, so there's the University Health Services, which is like basically any college health service, right? Um, you can go in, you can get a primary care physician there. Um, basically any type of medical stuff you want done or anything you need to see. It's not like a specialist, you can go um, there. Uh, we do have CAPS, which is like the mental health counseling. Uh, there is like a long wait for that, but you can schedule like a counselor via UHS as well, if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, if you are funded, there's really good health insurance. We get really good health insurance. Um, I would recommend if you, if you do come in funded that you get like the, there's like 15 extra dollars for like the option two for dental or like 20 extra for option three. Those are great because the, the basic dental services, I think only covers cleanings and things like that. And I've had to pay like a lot out of pocket for those type of things. Um, and then lastly, I think there's like a Rackham emergency fund. So if you are like an MS or PhD student in Rackham, maybe even Nicole can speak to this, but there's an emergency fund that you can apply for if you have like medical or dental emergencies, that's up to $2,500 during your time here. So if you do come into something that like you hit like a big financial burden that's associated with like a, a medical or dental emergency, um, you are awarded or you can be awarded and you most likely will be awarded, you know, up to $2,500 to, to cover that. So yeah, there's a lot of good health resources for students. Okay, great. So the question is how many hours do you spend on studying every week? Uh, maybe we can get a few perspectives here. Well, I think maybe, maybe I can go first. So, yes. uh, so now I'm in a master program. So, uh, I mean, if you want to uh, apply for a PhD program, maybe here or for in other school, you need to write, like uh, study hard to keep GPA, or you can you need to do some like research. Uh, while I have some of my some of my friends, they, they just want to uh, look for jobs, so they might spend more time finding interns or like uh, getting some skills in programming. Um, but I think basically, uh, you're really gonna spend like uh, three, uh, no, no, uh, six to eight hours per day, like studying, and I'm gonna have a break at the weekend. Does anybody have a different a different number they'd like to throw out? I, I, I think it really normal. I think it really depends on what classes you're taking partially like if you're taking like coding classes versus theoretical classes because of the different backgrounds you come from everyone in the department people have stronger points so for some people a coding class might take a lot more work whereas for some people like a theory class might take more work so I think it depends on your background and what you're taking um, I will say you know grad school is no joke like in undergrad I was told you'd be spending you know double the amount of credit hours outside of work, outside of class on work, and that did not happen for me. So when they said coming here, I think they said two to three times the number of credit hours. I was like, oh, that's not gonna be the case. And I don't spend that much. Like I don't spend that two to three times, but I spend significantly more than I did in undergrad. Um, so just be aware that it is a lot of work. And even if you're used to school being easy, it still will probably be more than you anticipate. That's a great summary. All right, what about class sizes? Um, maybe maybe the master's students can say the different class sizes they've encountered in both their core and elective courses, and then the PhD students could maybe um, also fill us in. So Hannah, Elise, Lingshuan, can you give us an idea from the master's perspective? Uh, sure, uh, so, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I, I, I just go first. So. Uh, I think the class size will be like uh, if you, if for some like uh, some core courses, it, it, will, it really depends on how many students are there are, are there in the program in at, in the same year. Where for some electives like uh, if you like uh, six fifteen or some other like about programming or some uh, some open electives that uh, it just students can choose freely from those open electives, so the course size might be smaller like. 
maybe even 20 or less than 20. So uh, it all depends on like what the electives you chose. Like some elective, if, we, if like uh, many students, they chose to have the same open elective that, that year, you might have quite a lot of students in the same class, but maybe next year, uh, there are not many students chose, uh, chose that elective. So uh, you might only have a few classmates. <laughs> that really depends. No, so I think elective classes could be as small as like 10, right? And then the core classes could be as large as, you know, this year we've done multiple sections of the same course. So there's mostly 50 or less in the class. But if you're taking another class in another department, you could be in a very large room with maybe 100 or, or more. But that's not going to be the norm. PhD students, what about Debraj? How, about, how do you see the class size? Um, so yeah, that could also range from like a very small class for like a specialized course, like um, a population genetics course that I took, which only had seven students. Um, whereas um, another, uh, I guess a more popular um, PhD course is like the seminal um, ideas in history of statistics course, where there's like a lot of discussion and um, it's a pretty entertaining class to take. Um, and I've seen, I think 30 people maybe take that in our year. So yeah, it also depends on, um, yeah, the area of research for that course. Um, like I think this year there's a, a causal inference course, which uh, quite a few people are taking. I think it's the first time that the department's offering that maybe in the last few years. Um, yeah. Great. Keep your questions coming. I have a question and um, maybe I want to try to ask all of you this question. So we'll see if we can keep your answers somewhat brief. Um, but I'm curious why you chose Michigan. Um, so let's see, let me start with Emily. Emily, why did you choose Michigan? Yeah, so, you know, thinking back to when I made my decision, I so I guess I came from a liberal arts background, a small school, and so I was unsure about how I would feel coming to Michigan since the department is so large. But when I visited, I was actually really pleased about the size of the department. I thought that there were a lot of strengths to the larger size. So I had ideas of what I wanted to work on, but the fact that there's so many faculty with diverse research areas and like I could you know, work on different projects with different people, that was really exciting. And then I also felt like though the department is big that there's a really strong community I also had an opportunity to work on the cancer training grant, which was like a huge perk for me um, research wise. So those are my main reasons. Awesome, thank you. Um, Ling Xuan, why did you choose Michigan? Uh, so when I first applied for the master program, I thought that uh, we, we will have the best uh, school of public health like here. So, uh, so I chose Michigan. And when I come here, I, actually I found the faculties here, they, they do have a lot of backgrounds. You can learn quite a lot and a very broad uh, like things from all those faculties. And they, they were really very helpful for, for like uh, while, while they are teaching courses because I, uh, I wasn't major in like math or statistics in my undergraduate. And when I came here, when I asked them questions about like, maybe some very basic questions, they are very willing to help me. And also I do enjoy doing research with the faculties here. They were really helpful and they know quite a lot about all these projects. So I really benefited a lot from like studying here. Great, thank you. Shumak, what about you? Um, so for me, I think it was that when I, when I came, when I wanted to consider this department, I think I wasn't very clear on exactly what I wanted to do at that point in terms of the specific kind of research I wanted to focus on. And the department's really big and there's like a really wide variety of research areas that people here work on. So have, I think the attraction was that I'd have a lot of flexibility in sort of dictating what my PhD trajectory would look like, both in terms of the problems that I'd be working on and the skill sets that I'd be picking up. And the, the variety that Michigan offers is probably what convinced me the most. That's great. Yeah. Elise, what convinced you? Yeah, so um, I was uh, persuaded to come to Michigan because I'd heard really excellent things about Ann Arbor. Um, I heard that it was a great place to live and I felt like this is kind of my first, I came to Michigan right out of undergrad. I felt like this was my first kind of like adult decision. I wanted to be somewhere where I wanted to live. Um, 
I also think that being in such a strong school of public health and university overall offers a lot of learning opportunities in terms of research, but also just going to seminars and other departments um, allows you to really get a good breadth of learning in addition to the depth of the coursework that you're taking within the department. Um, but I, I was the first virtual admitted students day, I guess our admitted students day was like about a week after everything shut down for COVID. I thought there was no way I was going to be able to choose to come here without having been here and seen it. Um, but really talking to people at Admitted Students Day was what sealed the deal for me. Everyone was really friendly and welcoming. And uh, I've, that's continued to be true since I've been here. That's excellent. Um, let's see, how about Debraj? So um, I did my undergrad and master's both in statistics and I developed an interest for more applied um, parts of statistics in my master's, specifically biostatistics, um, which is why I applied apply to lots of biostat uh, bio schools. And um, I guess one topic which I was really interested in was genetics. And I'd heard really good things about Michigan genetics, uh, like the Statgen um, group here in Michigan. And yeah, also um, Shomik got accepted along with me and I've known him pretty much all my life, <laughs> which really helped me make this decision <laughs> too. Um, yeah. And it's been a really good experience for me so far, like extremely brilliant. <laughs> That's great. Hannah, what, what made you choose Michigan? Uh, so kind of like what Emily and Elise were talking about, actually. I, so I came from a small liberal arts school as well, and I'm actually from um, the Pacific Northwest area. So coming out here like to the Midwest, I had no concept. Like I lived in Ohio when I was really young, but I have no memories of that. So I had no concept of what the Midwest was like and a big school was really daunting and my admitted students weekend was also virtual so I was a little nervous about that as well but um, just like Elise was saying like everyone I talked to in the department was really supportive and where I went to school we, we described like loot like as being really community community oriented and really supportive as a department as a whole and that is what Michigan felt like um, it felt like almost the department itself was like a liberal arts school uh, because it made the school a lot less daunting and large and everyone's really out there to help you um, succeed in the best way that you can. That's great. I, I love hearing all of these responses. They're warming my heart. Uh, ben, your turn. Yeah, I'll just echo a little bit of what Elise and what, what Chomik and, and Hannah said. So she, like I, I also had no idea what I wanted to do when I was coming to grad school. And so I think that just like the size of the department and uh, Kind of all the research topics that are happening in the department make it really a, an attractive place to go if you don't really know what you're super interested in because like if you find something along the way which you will inevitably find something that you might be interested in like somebody here is going to be working on that so you'll have the opportunity to work with people in that field um and then second like i went to uh like a big commuter school like two minutes from my house where i grew up so i, I lived with my mom for most of undergrad and like there was a big draw to come to like a you know big university with all the resources and things like that and uh, you know it hasn't disappointed in that way I think that like the university as a whole it's a really kind of like an unforgettable like organism as as it is so yeah so great thank you I'm going to keep asking questions unless I see them in the chat so please please feel free to to ask questions um I'm pretending as if I know what you want to hear about um, so what about, and as you spoke about, you know, sort of making these adult decisions and coming to Ann Arbor, how easy it, was it to find housing or, you know, to, to figure out where to live, who to live with, et cetera. Can anybody speak to the housing situation or logistics once you're here? So something that was important to me when I was looking for housing was paying attention to bus routes. Um, in general, there's like lots of different housing options in Ann Arbor. You can rent part of a house, you can live in an apartment by yourself, you can have a roommate, which is what I did my first year. I found, I think, a Facebook group and I lived with a nutrition student, so another student at the School of Public Health, which was really great to get to know someone in another department. Um, and like I mentioned, so living on a bus route was like a really important thing for me just because that was my main way of getting to school, so... Those are a couple things from my experience. I would also that. Oh, 
Go for it. Sorry, Sorry. just wanted to add on to the busing is that with your Michigan ID, you get free access to all of the Ann Arbor buses and the Michigan buses. Um, I don't know if that was mentioned before, but that's a really um, nice perk of being a student and the buses are a great way to get around. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I didn't get the chance to come to Ann Arbor to look at housing before um, choosing where I wanted to live. And that was a little, that made me really nervous. Like I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I actually found that the resources, um, I think like off the Diag is the place I was looking to find a roommate and that went really well. I'm living with a person in the um, school of information and that's been really lovely. Again, knowing someone outside the department and just using the resources. I think Michigan actually has quite a few great resources and talking to current students about where they're living and figuring out if you wanna to walk to school, if you wanna take the bus to school, I think those are all really important things to think about. I would also just add on closely then is if, if you are thinking about coming here, start sooner rather than later. Um, I think I made the mistake when I first moved here thinking that I would be able to find a place really quickly. Uh, and that's, I mean, you can find a place really quickly, but like if you wanna find something that's like, you know, makes you happy and, and the places you want to live, it's better to start sooner rather than later and just like signing a lease on something you've never been to. But. That's great, thank you. Um, there is a question about if anyone um, was working in industry and then came back for grad school. I think all of you came from another school, right? None of you have a background that you were working before. Okay, so unfortunately we don't have that, but. Anna, if you could e email us, we can find you a student that has that background and we'd be happy to connect you um, with that person so that, you know, you can get a better experience with that. So please feel free to email me, Kidwell at UMish, and just remind me that question and, and I'd be happy to get you in touch with the student. Um, there's also a question about the expected MS cohort size. I, I answered that. It's hard to predict. I would like to say that even with the, we have a larger cohort this last year, a first year master's students currently, there are 94, 97 of them. Um, we have, however, split all of those core courses in half so that they're not massive, massive core courses. They are learning in smaller groups. And then we also have study groups formed, which are even smaller groups of our students. Um, Ling Xuan is actually leading some of the study groups. Maybe he can speak a little bit more about that um, because I think that's been an awesome resource that our students have had. Uh, so basically we have like study groups for uh, core, uh, core courses in the first year, like uh, we have 601, 650, 651, 602. Uh, and uh, basically it's, uh, I think our responsibility is to just kind of like uh, another kind of office hour, we just gonna help you to get through uh, maybe some course materials and to explain more about like coding because like when you learn about theory in some homework, you need to code by yourself and maybe uh, some of the students they are fresh to those uh, R language or some other software. So we're gonna help them uh, with, with their coding. And if you have, if they have some like uh, questions about course material, uh, and homework, we're gonna uh, help them a bit, just give them some hints or like uh, help them deal with some uh, problems, but we will not like directly uh, feed them with the, with the answer. So it's kind of, uh, because we learned this, all these courses in the past year, and uh, I think our, our grades are pretty good. So we're gonna uh, kind of use our understanding to combine with what they learned from class to help them uh, understand the course materials better. Uh, thank you. I think the study groups are something we started during the pandemic and we've kept because they've been so successful and it does help um, form smaller groups of students that you can connect with um, and, and learn from. And, and so they've been really great. There's a question about um, being a, if they're a permanent resident of a different, okay, Fatma, thank you. You put that in there because I don't know the answer to that. If you're a permanent resident of another state, how long it takes to qualify for in-state tuition in Michigan. Did any of your students, did any of you all apply for permanent residency in Michigan? No. Yeah, but Fatma just added a link that maybe you can that you can click on for that question. I, I do know, um, not via my own application for it, but through people that I know that if you do come here for school, um, you won't qualify for in-state. Residency, okay. Okay, thank you. I think you have to work, like you have to have come here and then work for a certain amount of time and then, so if you come here and then enroll in school, then they won't ever classify it as in-state tuition. Correct. 
Okay, thank you. And there's a question about if any of your classes are being taught using less traditional teaching styles or structures. Shumik, you nodded. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, but I think the most of the core courses are fairly traditional in in the context of like online learning during the pandemic. But um, I can certainly think of two classes which were a little less traditional. Um, one of them is actually happening right now. I think Ben, Emily, and I are all all of us are enrolled in that class. It's um, it's a class where we learn about how to effectively communicate ideas and statistics to undergraduate students. So it's more of like a class where you learn about taking a class. And that's, it's, it's not, because it's not a traditional course where you have like a textbook and some assignments. So that's, it's a really non-traditional class in the sense that we talk about what we learned in terms of what a good class looks like. So we have different experiences. So we try to figure out what went well for us and what didn't and hopefully arrive at an idea of what a good syllabus design looks like, what a good class design looks like, and so on and so forth. And I think that given the, given the extra advantage that we have in terms of a lot of the coding that we do, which we can share screens and collaborate on code chunks and so on and so forth, um, that class is really interesting. Um, the other class that was a little less traditional is the one that Debraj mentioned. Both of these are PhD level courses. This is the one that Dr. Little taught us. Um, it's called Seminal Ideas and Statistics where there's approximately, I think um, probably 12 or 13 different areas of statistics with some really interesting and impactful papers that researchers have published. So we're really asked to study those papers and there's maybe a set of talking points that Dr. Little has for us as prompts to think better about these papers. But eventually we just talk about what the, we got from the paper. So it's kind of like a class, but it's also a general club. Um, and those were the less traditional examples that I can think of. And I enjoyed both of them immensely. So great examples, thank you. Look, next question, and don't worry, um, you know, not many faculty are here, so please be honest. How accessible do you find your professors to be? I will, I will, everything that happens here will stay here besides if someone watches it on YouTube. So go ahead. My experience has been, um, they've been extremely accessible. Um, uh, so uh, my advisor, um, even though he's extremely busy, still makes like at least one or two hours for me every week so that we can meet and talk about the progress of my research. And I think that's probably the experience for almost everyone else in this panel. Um, even other than that, if I have any specific question that I probably want to ask to any other professor, maybe for a class that I'm taking or just in general about my research, um, uh, prior to the pandemic, if I just went to their door and knocked, um, I would receive an answer and uh, I'd, we would maybe talk for five or 10 minutes. Um, even now, if I just send an email and um, ask for a virtual meeting, um, everyone's extremely happy to um, meet and chat. So yeah, I'd say my experience has been really good. That's great. What about um, from Elise, Hannah, or Ling Shuan as a master's student? How how ac accessible do you find professors? Um, I um, would say, oh, sorry, go ahead, Hannah. Okay. Um, I was going to say, in general, I think people are really accessible, like faculty are responsive. But I will put the caveat on with online classes that period of time, there was a little less accessibility. I um, mean, I think it was partially because faculty didn't really know the students well. Um, so sometimes it was harder to find because office hours, you know, when they're in person, like now I feel like if I go knock on someone's door, it's an immediate response and they're happy to help, but it was harder to make that contact online. Hopefully that won't be a problem moving forward, but I will put that caveat out, out there. That's that's fair. We do hope everything is in person as it has been lately moving forward. Elise, what would you like to add? Yeah, um, I would say that for the core courses, office hour, there are always office hours. Um, professors try to have them at different times so that different students can attend. For the core courses, they can sometimes get busy. Um, so you may not always get your answer right away. You might have to sort of wait in a line of questions, but that's just kind of how it goes. Um, but 
other than that, I found my professors to be really accessible. Even though all my classes are in person, a lot of my professors are having both in-person and virtual office hours on different days of the week, which gives a lot of flexibility um, for how you feel most comfortable getting in touch with your professors as well, which I think is really nice. That's a great point. Um, there's a question about how long classes have been back in person at this point. Yeah, um, I think most classes moved back in person uh, beginning last semester, so the fall. Um, and I've had now two full semesters fully in person. Yes, we did have some of our um, courses for the first year masters in the fall were remote. However, they still had some that were in person, but um, I believe all but one of our biostatistics courses um, this semester is in person and we expect that to be the case moving forward. Really great questions. Are there other questions? What about, um, I'm gonna ask for those of you who are doing research, um, what are you working on? So Shumik, what are you working on? What is your research area? Oh, um, I'm working on um, a metric which talks about directed dependencies and graphs. Um, so primarily the focus is on being able to talk about non-parametric kernel density estimates and the estimator I'm working on really tries to understand a sense of direction of direction of association in a multivariate data set. So a, a motivating example for that might be where you have um, some mental health problems that patients report in terms of depression and anxiety, for example, and those are often comorbid in the same patient. But um, the way that clinicians approach treatment of these um, separate mental health issues are slightly different, even though these diseases do share some sort of common um, arc, common etiology. So the primary focus is on being able to understand which of depression and anxiety is the more dominating phenotype in an individual and thereby cater someone's um, treatment accordingly. That was really great. I love how the first half of your answer was super statistical and your second half really put it into application so that we could understand, you know, so what, so what, what do we do with that? I, I, I that was excellent. And that's really the goal of, of the program. Ben, are you working on any research projects? Yeah, but I, that sucks. I have to follow Shomik because he did such a good job. <laughs> uh, mine's, I, I um, am working with imaging data. So brain imaging data. So I, I came to Michigan really interested in working with like a, uh, applications in mental health and psychiatry and substance abuse and things like that. And I've kind of found like a niche, although there was a lot of ways to work on that type of thing. I think I was really interested in kind of how um, like brain networks can affect um, outcomes in, in adolescence and their development um, moving forward. So like the mathematical part of the research is about dealing with kind of these really sparse graphs. So graphs that kind of have, you know, every connection might not exist but only some of the connections exist so some of the brain nodes firing might be important um some a lot of them aren't you want to find the ones that are important you want to keep them important you want to look at the ones that are important and say these are not important um and then how does that work when you have like group structures like so your brain has different parts of it that that work um and work together so how can you kind of use that to like make things like if one part of your brain isn't super important you know it makes sense to shrink a lot of those like signals per se but yeah so awesome thank you i would i want to hear from everyone but i also want to make sure now that questions are coming in so i'm gonna i'm gonna change and go back to the question so there is a question about did you face any difficulties enrolling in classes with respect to the number of available spots for core or elective courses so is there a hard have you ever had a hard time registering for a course See a lot of shaking heads so I'd probably like to say that um one course which i did probably have i wouldn't say a hard time but i had to register a bit in advance was epid 516 which is a required course if you take that part of epid there's also another option epid 601 but if you wanted to take epid 516 you probably want to register for that 
definitely by um, it, it's it, it's um, offered in the winter semester. So you want to register for that by November or whenever the deadlines uh, like the thing starts. Yeah, I want to add to that. Um, my experience has been pretty much the same, um, but specifically if you're applying for courses which are not biostat courses, I think that's where you might have some trouble. So for example, Debraj spoke about 516 and there's a really popular Python and data science course that's hosted across the SAS department and the School of Information. That's usually another one where there's a wait list because that's a pretty popular course. But um, if you are persistent enough, you can get through usually. People drop classes after the first 14 days. So it shouldn't be a problem in general. Yeah, this semester, I, I'm taking a class in the stats department for Bayesian. And I got in right away, but I had about, I don't know, five, three to five friends in biostats that were on the waiting list. And all of them ended up getting into the class. So you just have to, you know, even if you're on the waiting list, don't be afraid. If you email the registrar, eventually that will get figured out. Yes, Nicole and Fatma do an excellent job of trying to get students into all the classes that they would like. So we do really try very hard um, to, to make that happen. Okay, so here's a really interesting question. Um, what aspect or aspects of your experience would you hope to see improved for future students? So we've talked a lot about the, the wonderful things, you know, and we all know that there are so many wonderful things, but there's always things that can be improved. So um, can anyone think of of something that you could point out for what what you would have what you hope to see improve for incoming students? I think we got a little taste of that in terms of like the courses being remote, um, you know, but hopefully that's not an issue going forward. Is there anything else? Elise? Yeah. Um, so for me, I think one thing um, is, professional development and career advising within the department. Um, and I am hearing that there's a lot of effort to improve this. Um, for example, we have the alumni of the month where you get to hear from alumni who have taken different career paths. Obviously your advisors are academics. And so that's kind of what they know. And sometimes it can be challenging to learn about career paths um, that are outside of academics or academic research. So reaching out to the Career Center is a great addition to that. Um, and networking with alumni has also been a path that I found to be really helpful, um, but those are things that kind of I had to take the initiative with. So I think it's something that our department is working on, um, and it's something that there's access to if, if you take the initiative to do that for yourself, um, but it is going to take sort of that jump start from you in my experience, at least. Yeah, that's a, a totally fair point, Elise, and I, I agree that it is somewhere where we are trying to improve in our department. And in fact, we are, um, several of us faculty members, myself included, are working with Rackham, our broader graduate um, program, where we have funding to actually improve our professional development. And we will be inputting um, many more professional development um, uh, skills, knowledge, um, you know, all of that actually into the curricula. So you will see that that will improve over the next, next few years. Anyone else have anything? So many, so many good things. <laughs> I, say, I think that, I think that this is something that department and that Kelly addressed earlier in this too, and that you know they departments addressed with us recently, and I think it's that there was a like a, a big emphasis on on grades and things like that, and. And that was like your metric of like how much you learned in these courses. And I think they're kind of trying to direct about how it looked like you might have not got an A, but you had an A minus, but you still learned a lot and you still got a lot from this class. And that's really where the emphasis on, on coming to this department and going to these classes. And that's where the emphasis should be placed and not on like the letter grade that you get from these courses. And I think, you know, I think that stems from a lot of us being overachievers. I mean, you guys are all probably incredibly smart and, and did incredibly well in your undergrad. And, that's why you're admitted. And I think that it's it's hard to transition to grad school. So I think the department's trying actively to kind of help us not so much emphasize like this like numerical measure of success and more of a like an emotional and educational level of success. And I, I think that that was not really in place when I came here. And it's it's more now actively trying to like become a a, a staple point in the department. So I think that that's a good thing. But you know, if that keeps going in that direction, I think it's a it's a fantastic sign. So. Oh, that's great. That's great. 
There's a question here about sort of the choice between biostatistics and statistics. If you've, if you've felt limited by choosing biostatistics as opposed to just purely statistics, I imagine many of you also thought about a statistics route um, in and of itself. So, you know, I, I can speak from those career placement opportunities, right? I think many of our students are getting careers that individuals from statistics are getting, um, you know, in tech companies, right? They're not just all going to pharma. Um, that some of our, our PhD students are getting statistics um, professorships, not just biostatistics. But as students, can any of you speak to that sort of trade-off between biostatistics and statistics? Shumik, how about? Yeah, sure. Um, I can speak specifically in the context of that question on the topic of mental health, for example. Um, of course, I, I'm a part of the biostats department, so it would be unfair to comment on the exposure that the stat department might offer um, because I didn't live through that experience. But I can tell you that for the biostat department, um, because we collaborate with clinicians, I think on average more than you'd find from a traditional stats department, you get a lot of clinical background, which I think is really essential to be to being able to talk about um, analyzing data arising out of mental health studies. Um, and that insight is really key to being able to talk about meaningful findings that you can have from your data, right? Um, but the other part that I think that I probably think that Biostat has an edge over um, stat departments in terms of, I would say, being able to talk more about interpreting results in the sense that um, I, I just speak to a lot of my friends who, who are working in stat departments, for example. And I think because the training that we get is that we have to be able to talk about interpreting our findings so that clinicians are able to make sense of them. So I think our training in terms of making our findings more accessible and being better at communicating our findings is really what gives biostats an edge over statistics departments. But no hate to statistics departments, they're really good as well. <laughs> well, that's great. Any other student have a have an, a, any advice or opinion there, Elise? Yeah, I applied to both biostatistics and statistics departments when I applied to grad school. Um, I had someone tell me that basically a uh, someone who's trained in biostats can do almost any job that a, someone who's trained in stats can do. Your core courses are going to feel basically like a statistics curriculum, um, just that the examples and applications provided are in sort of the health and medicine field. Um, that's kind of the distinction to me, but someone who's trained in statistics can't do all the jobs that someone who's trained in biostatistics can do. For example, I'm going to be working in clinical trials that's a very specific biostatistics focused background that you need for that. So I actually think that biostats opens as many, if not more opportunities than statistics in my experience, at least. Yeah, that's, that's a really great way to think about it there. All right, we're coming up to the end of our time here. So if there are any last minute um, questions, I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, I'm just going to maybe end with, again, just very brief answers, but going around to every student in terms of if you have any piece of advice um, for our admitted students in terms of making their decision. Um, it doesn't have to be Michigan specific, right? But just any piece of advice moving forward, either in their decision making or, you know, in their graduate, um, in their pursuit of graduate studies going forward, whether it's at Michigan or not. So um, let's see, Hannah, can I pick on you first? What kind of advice would you give these students? Yeah, um, I think for me, at least in the decision process, the thing that was really stressful to me is, am I making the right decision? Am I going to the right school? And Michigan has been a really great choice for me and I'm very happy here, but I think if I had chosen another school, I would have been able to make that experience good for me as well. So it's about what you're putting into your own decision. Um, and once you make your decision, you should commit full heartedly and just throw yourself into it because um, that's how you'll make the most of your experience and get the most out of your education. That's awesome. Uh, yes, totally. I agree with that. Ling Shuan, how about you? Any advice for these students? Um, I think personally, I'm very lucky and happy to, to, to join uh, uh, University of Michigan as page. So 
Uh, I think maybe may, maybe my advice is once you make uh, make a decision, uh, you're gonna like uh, you're gonna you're gonna trust yourself. You are making the right right decision. You you, you won't like try to compare like thinking uh, continue thinking like if I go to somewhere else, will this be better or will it be worse? To try to convince yourself that you make the best choice because. Uh, I think for myself, I just focus on my life here, and I think I'm I'm very happy and satisfied studying and living here, and that and that's, that's, I think that's the most important thing to me. Definitely, definitely. So a lot of advice for wholeheartedly, you know, sticking, you know, making yourself in that program. Um, Emily, advice. Yeah, I think my main advice is just realizing that I mean, you're choosing an academic program, but you're also choosing what your life is going to look like for maybe only two years, but, you know, six years or so. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors involved in that. It's a really tough decision. Um, and like Hannah said, whatever decision you make will be the right one for you. And I think as far as like, once you get started, sort of the same advice, this is like your life. This isn't just being a student, like being a grad student is kind of your whole full-time thing. Um, it's really a journey and it's important to have things outside of school that bring you fulfillment in addition to all of the great fulfillment that being a grad student can bring. Completely agree with that, seeking that balance, making sure that you have that balance and thinking of your, your life as a complete person, not just a biostatistician. Ben, how about any advice from you? Yeah, I guess my biggest advice would be take care of yourself during this time of your life you know it's a very stressful time of your life and I guess my previous advice would be don't stress but I don't think that's great advice because sometimes you're just going to stress but I mean take care of yourself this is just one decision and, and like everyone says you know you're whatever decision you make is going to be the right decision for you and and you know you have to trust that and whatever happens I mean you're all you know probably incredibly gifted people and then shows by getting admitted to this department so don't you know just take care of yourself and when you get into grad school take care of yourself too you know like this is a, it's a stressful time and um you you should always recognize that you come first when you're doing those things so great that's great the barrage yeah um my advice would be probably um uh, and fingers crossed that you won't but you probably will experience roadblocks um in your grad school experience um just know that everyone else is going through the same thing um it's not just you so feel free to reach out to your peers your friends professors um, because you will get help if you just ask for it, yeah. And uh, definitely work-life balance is extremely important. Um, yeah. That's, that's great. Elise, your advice? Yeah, um, I guess two things. One, basically everyone has talked about work-life balance. It's really worth it to make the effort to find your work-life balance or your school-life balance. Um, the other thing is that probably one of the most important things you'll learn in grad school is that there's so much left for you to learn and that's okay. And you should ask as many questions as you can and learn as much as you can because you're around really brilliant people at Michigan or wherever you go for grad school. Um, and don't feel like you don't belong here because you don't know something. Um, you're, you're in this meeting right now because you belong here. I love that. I love that. Shumik, we'll end with you, your advice for the students. Yeah, everyone, this is why I don't want to go last. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, everyone's done a really good job. I have, yeah, I agree with everything everyone said. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's hard to think of anything else because of all the wonderful advice that everyone before you gave. So completely, completely agree there. So we just, we're so grateful that you all could join us today in this virtual admitted students event. Um, we're so thankful for your engagement via the questions. Um, like I said, please feel free to, to email us after the fact if you think of anything else. Um, we'd love to see you here at Michigan, but we know that you have bright futures ahead wherever you may end up. So um, best of luck in your decision, and um, we hope to see you in the fall. So thank you again so much, and thank you to all the students, um, for our current students, this panel.